Since COVID has hit these shores, we at BPS have been making videos to educate, inform and to entertain you in our bright and breezy way. This next video is different. It's more important. And we're asking you to take the time to watch it. And if you like it, please share it. Thank you. And now we're pushing ourselves in the blink of time to 1.2 degrees Celsius warming, and we are on a trajectory that would take us to three, three and a half degrees Celsius warming. In fact, it would push back the climate clock, not one, not two, not three, but five to 10 million years. Doesn't that send, let's say, enough evidence that we want to stay away from two degrees Celsius warming? Yeah, I mean, if business can't change, business needs to be forced to change. I mean, this issue is too big. This is the issue of our generation. I think all of us, and particularly people in positions of responsibility, have got to accept that. You know, the stakes are just simply too high. And wouldn't we just be the, the biggest, dumbest assholes in the history of the universe if we wipe it out here in the only garden that exists? Hello and welcome to Broadcast and Production Services. And today we have a special treat for you. It's interview time. And behind the curtain, shall we see who we have? Let's have a look. It's Sue Martineau. Hello, Sue. Hi, how are you? Welcome. Um, tell us, please introduce yourself. I'm, I'm the interim CEO of Wildscreen. I'm having the most amazing time. I started the role in July, um, eight weeks before um, Wildscreen Festival 2020, which was fantastic. We hopefully talk about that a bit later. But yes, no, it's it's been a roller coaster of a ride and we're extremely busy at the moment where, you know, the world has reset. So we're looking at resetting ourselves and, you know, making sure that our messages are clear and, and our objectives are key to the world as it is now. Absolutely. Um, and for our viewers who don't know, can you explain Wild Screen and what it stands for? Of course. Wild Screen is a charity, first and foremost a charity, that has been in existence for 38 years. And, you know, the, the, the main objectives of the charity is to share awe-inspiring images to ensure that conservation around the world is empowered and people actually want to take part in looking after conservation. And never has it been more important with, you know, the current climate crisis and the lack of biodiversity. So we're here to give a platform to filmmakers, photographers, conservationists and scientists and to ensure authentic voices are amplified and heard. Well, that's, that's amazing. So you collate and channel all sorts of material about the natural world. Would that be correct? Well, what, what we do is we facilitate the, the union really between filmmakers and conservationists and photographers and the scientists and ensure that these compelling stories get told because let's be honest, images are more powerful than words. Yes. And, 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 and you know, and, and images, we've all, you, at the moment, the natural history wildlife programs on TV are the most watched not well, the mo what most watched programs on Netflix, for example. Absolutely, and we're obviously in. Let's be honest, the age of climate change. Never has it been more urgent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Prince William getting involved with Earthshot. You know, he it's he he wants to make a difference, and you know, and he has he wants to look, launch this particular program to ensure that, you know, he can stand back and say, I made a difference. Um, tell us about the industry support. You've obviously had help from the industry in the past. Well, you know, it, we are the key for the industry. We are the world leading charity that um, attracts the whole of the industry f across the globe. And, you know, it started off in Bristol. It's got its natural heritage in Bristol, but actually it's a global, globally known charity. And we've just launched our network and, and on our network, in fact, you know, we have all the big players, Silverback, Plimsoll, Icon, anyone who's anyone in the wildlife film industry or, or in photography is, is part of our network. 
fantastic. It sounds it sounds a very admirable and exciting you know place to be and and to and to work. Do you have sort of a lot of links with the BBC as well? Yeah, in fact, Julian Hector, who's head of the Natural History Unit for the BBC, is on our board, which is wonderful. So um, the BBC are actually a big sponsor of our wildlife uh, wild screen film festival, and you know, and we get so much support from them during the festival this year they actually um helped us develop and produce several of our sessions which was great brilliant and now talking about your festival how did you cope with ob the obvious challenge of covid and not being able to have anyone physically at it what was what was your strategy well you know at, it, once the decision had been made to take the festival online that was probably around april time it was all systems go and you know and actually there are so many many positives to having an online festival and as you can imagine we, we wanted this to be the most accessible festival ever and we had 1900 attendees which was just wonderful and many of those were from developing countries 43 different countries attended in the end and we kept and and one great thing as well is that we could keep our, our offering online until all the way to the end of December. So we were actually selling more reasonable tickets afterwards. So people who'd missed out on the festival could still see all the content, which was just wonderful. Yes, it must be different as well, because I suppose there's a lot of pre-production that goes into such an event. W would you agree? Absolutely. You know, running an online festival is almost like running the event three times. So first of all, you've got to get everybody in the same place virtually to start with. And, and that's, a, a you know, a whole mission in itself. And then you record, you actually record the, you know, the session and then you have to edit the session. And then what we did was we interspersed the um, recorded sessions with live sessions because we wanted to, people to feel that they were still attending a live event. So we ran the festival from Floating Harbour, um, based in Bristol. And, and of course, we, we set up a mini stu studio with um, windows all around so people could see the change in weather. And, and, and we were talking to attendees throughout the day and had separate sessions that were just live sessions, which was wonderful and it kept the whole community connected throughout throughout the five days, yes. which was wonderful, very special. And, and I heard you had some quite special speakers, didn't you, at that event? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, we had, you know, David Attenborough and Greta Thunberg and James Cameron and, you know, Jörg Rockström, which is, a you know, one of the leading scientists in the wildlife world. That's, that's quite a rock star list, if I may say. Yeah, it was. It was. <laughs> we were... We were the envy of other festivals, let's say. Definitely, definitely. Do, do you have, do you have a, a sort of relationship with, with those people that goes back? Do they sort of help you with lots of content? Oh, yeah. You know, David Attenborough is a patron of mm. Wildscreen and always has been actually for the past 38 years because he, more, more so than any other conservationist, understood very, very early on the power of media and the power of film and the power of photography. You know, it's all very well talking about something that is happening in an ecosystem the other side of the world. But if you can show something that's happening, then it's far more powerful, you know, and, and, re and even re recently, uh, you know, on our local, in our local ecosystems, you, uh, the, it, only the other day I saw, you know, a face mask around the wing of a bird. You know, if that doesn't tell you, you know, to do not throw your face masks on the ground, you know, make sure you take them home with you. What else does? What's important as well is to remember our charitable mission, you know, and it, it's so important to us that we give these authentic voices a platform to be heard. And one of the things that we introduced to the festival this year was a, a, a new um, competition called the Official Selection. And that was for up and coming filmmakers who actually haven't had the opportunity to um, have won awards before. So um, we had a lot of young, newer filmmakers take part in that. For example, we had um, Rebecca Comas and her team who we, she won the Programmer Prize. Her and her team won the Programmer Prize for their film Cries of Our Ancestors. 
And what was great about that, it showed the interconnected relationship between people and chimpanzees of Papua New Guinea. And with the, the money that she won, she won £2,000, she fed that back into the village to ensure that, that, that they had clean water. So it was a, a full cycle. You know, yeah. she told the story, we could engage with that, but then with her winnings, she actually helped the village where the stories were told. And, and that's kind of one of the things that we're picking up on. It's all very well, you know, these big corporates going into these communities and producing the films, but actually the communities themselves, A, don't get to see the film and don't develop themselves in, in any way. And one of the things that we're really pushing for with our network is ensuring that training and mentorships and internships happen so that people all over the world will actually play their part and be able to play their part as storytellers and not just carriers of equipment. Yes, I, I totally understand that. And as you said, I suppose one of the advantages, I've got to look for a positive. One of the positives of COVID is that you've now developed that online presence and, and understand it more, which, it, which ironically is helping you to reach out further and increase your accessibility. Absolutely, absolutely. We've had, the, you know, the most amazing converse, conversations with people. And we always have had, you know, the charity is world renowned, so that's fine. But the, the fact that we've had this enormous presence online is outstanding. The, the David and Greta um, interview, by the way, you know, on our YouTube channel was watched by over 64,000 people, which was quite remarkable. That's, that's something else. That's a very good viewing figures indeed. Yeah, well, absolutely. Um, brilliant. Well, Sue, thank you so much for taking the time out to talk to us. We really appreciate it. Um, and I hope, you know, maybe we can interview you again later in the year and see how you're going. I'd love to come and tell you more about our network once we're, we're, we're relaunching it, actually. So that would be wonderful if you could play a part in that. Brilliant. Well, Sue, thank you very much. I think that was really exciting to see. And I hope you enjoyed the clips we show you. And as Sue said, if we're good, she'll come back and visit us again, which would be very kind. Thank you. And now we're pushing ourselves in the blink of time to 1.2 degrees Celsius warming. And we are on a trajectory that would take us to three, three and a half degrees Celsius warming in fact, it would push back the climate clock, not one, not two, not three, but five to 10 million years. Doesn't that send, let's say, enough evidence that we want to stay away from two degrees Celsius warming? Yeah, I mean, if business can't change, business needs to be forced to change. I mean, this issue is too big. This is the issue of our generation. I think all of us, and particularly people in positions of responsibility, have got to accept that. You know, the stakes are just simply too high. And wouldn't we just be the, the biggest, dumbest assholes in the history of the universe if we wipe it out here in the only garden that exists? Did I go dark? Was that a rant? When it comes to the biggest market for global wildlife products, Hong Kong is really where it's at. You can find everything from ivory to tiger skin and bones to pangolin scales in these very streets. People we are listening to us now are the people who made these films. And it's my belief that, that the world would not be as aware of the crisis if it wasn't for the work that they do. I think we need to say that the radical is absolutely not radical. The radical is normal and we must. You know, if you, if you want to call that radical, then we've all got to get radical because, you know, whether it be in terms of climate change or race or inequality, you know, and, and, and let's not get this wrong, all of those things are deeply, deeply interlinked, um, then we've got to be more radical if we are going to survive as a species, because guess what? The world is going to survive. It's just, are we going to survive in it?